Greetings, everyone. My name is Philomena O'Brien, and I'm the Marketing Manager at Ergomed and PSR. We're glad you could join us today for our webinar titled The Patient Experience and Introduction to Drug Development and Clinical Trials. This webinar is an initiative of the Ergomed and PSR Patient Organization Representative Board, which is supported by Find a Cure and Aparito. Before we commence, I'd like to run through a couple of quick housekeeping items. Firstly, we expect this webinar to run for approximately 30 minutes, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers. And secondly, you're very welcome to send us your questions at any point during the presentation. You can use the question box that you'll see on your screen. And now I'd like to welcome our two speakers for today. Firstly, Krista Van Kahn, who's the Strategic Director for Rare Diseases at Ergomed and PSR. And our second speaker, Rick Thompson, is the CEO of Find a Cure. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to Krista to start. Thank you very much, Philomena. So I've been working in the area of drug development for over 20 years and always enjoy explaining my work to other people. In the next 10 minutes or so, I will try to explain in a simple way the different steps needed to bring a new drug to the market. This first slide shows you very high level, the process uh, split into four different stages, starting at the top with discovery and development. This is very uh, basic research that takes place in the lab, uh, laboratory um, where a lot of different drugs, potential drugs can be identified that could be used for treatment. Um, this can lead to a large scale of so-called candidates and they need to be narrowed down to see which drug has most potential. And this phase, this stage also includes research on the mechanism of action of the drug. So basically, how does the drug work? What does it do in the body? Once a potential candidate has been identified in this stage. The next stage is the so-called preclinical research. This again happens in the laboratory and uh, consists of a wide array of different tests to see if the drug is safe for humans. And the different tests can be split into two different categories. The ones that are performed in cell or tissue cultures those are called in vitro tests, and the ones that are performed in laboratory animals, which are called in vivo tests. Once all these tests have been completed, um, the regulatory authorities, so the Food and Drug Administration in the US or the European Medicines Association in Europe will be asked for permission to start testing the drug in humans. This is where the clinical research stage starts. And this is actually where patients will be involved. So these tests or studies or clinical trials, as they are called, are performed usually in a hospital setting. Some of the tests, some of the early tests, will usually take place in uh, human healthy volunteers and later on patients will become involved, but I will tell you more about the different phases of clinical research in a moment. The last stage in the development process of a new drug is called marketing authorization. And this is actually where the FDA for the US or the EMA in the EU will look at all the data that has been collected during this whole process and will decide whether the drug can be brought to the market. So a license will be given that it may be prescribed to patients. After this approval, 
the process of negotiating price and ensuring reimbursement can start. To give you an idea of the total time involved from discovery until a drug is brought to the market, uh, I will lead you through this slide. On the left hand side, in the left column, you can see the different stages which I explained in the previous slide. From bottom left discovery until the clinical research phase one, two and three at the top. In the second column, you can see the success rate of an individual phase. So for example, a drug that reaches phase one clinical research will only have about a 50% chance of going on to the next phase. So the phase two clinical research. The third column gives you an idea of average timelines. And if you add all of those up, you can you will see you come to a total um, time of between seven and 15 years from discovery until drug approval. The last column shows you the chance that a drug will actually reach the approval at different phases. So a drug that is first brought into preclinical research only has a 10% chance of ever reaching market approval. The timelines here are average timelines for a new drug in a common disease. And um, I'm glad to say that this total time can be shorter in certain situations. For instance, in the case of drug repurposing, which means an existing drug can be used for another disease. For instance, a drug used in a common disease may also be effective in a rare disease. And in that case, the development process can be a lot shorter because the safety data is already available. In addition, there are several fast track procedures, both in the US and in Europe, for instance, for so-called breakthrough therapies. And lastly, in case of very small patient populations, so ultra rare diseases, clinical study phases can be combined. So in that case, also the total duration of drug development can be shortened. Um, please do not forget that once the license is in place, so there is market approval, you, first, you still need to get the reimbursement in place. And the time needed for that can vary quite a lot from country to country. US is relatively fast, Europe, it can vary between one to even three years before a drug is fully reimbursed and accessible to patients. In the next couple of slides, I want to tell you a little bit more about the clinical research and the different phases within clinical research. Phase one is what, they also, what is also called first in human, F-I-H, which literally means that the drug is given for, to humans for the first time. Usually this is done with a small group of healthy volunteers um, and only in case that a drug is very toxic, for instance, uh, an oncology medicine, it may not be ethical to give the drug to healthy volunteers and patients are uh, used instead because they might also benefit from the drug. The goal in phase one is primarily to check the safety and to find a safe dose and take a look at any medical problems. Phase two includes what is called the proof of concept study, which means checking whether the drug actually does what it is supposed to do. So again, the drug is given to a small group of patients, in this case, always patients, not healthy volunteers, because you want to look at the effect of the drug. The goal, again, is to investigate the drug safety further and to find out how it works in patients with a specific disease. And this phase is also used to find the most effective dose. So not only safe, but effective. Phase three 
The goals are very similar to that in phase two, but now the drug is tested in a larger group of patients. So there is more variety and there is more data to be collected. Um, this phase, studies in this phase are also called pivotal studies. And this means the clinical trial that intends to provide the ultimate evidence and data that the regulatory authorities, so the FDA or EMA, use to decide whether or not to approve a new medicine. And lastly, phase four are actually studies that are performed after the drug has been approved and they are used to collect even further safety data and to collect data about long-term effects and also to check how the drug works in the real world. So less controlled circumstances than clinical trials. Before I hand over to the next speaker, I would like to explain a few important terms to you, which are often used in clinical trials. So when you read the title of a clinical trial, you will almost always see these terms. The first one, randomized. Um, and the little icon I've used here are dice, because it's actually like throwing a dice. So by chance, patients will be divided um, into one treatment group or another treatment group. And the reason why this is done in a randomized way is that uh, you want to ensure that the two treatment groups that or even more than two treatment groups, but th that the different treatment groups are very comparable. So when you divide patients by chance into different treatment groups, there is the highest probability that you will have an equal distribution of important characteristics such as age, sex, severity of the disease, um, other medication being used, and, and other factors that may be important. And by doing this, you increase the reliability of the data at the end of the study. Double blind means that neither the participant nor the investigator will know who is receiving which treatment. And this is also a procedure that is used to obtain more reliable study results. And lastly, placebo controlled means that one treatment group will receive placebo. Placebo is an inactive drug which looks, tastes and smells the same as the active drug. So the patient will not know whether they are receiving placebo or the investigational drug. And the purpose of such a placebo group is to account for the so-called placebo effect, which means that people think they are feeling better just because they are receiving treatment. Um, in addition to placebo controlled, you can also have trials that are comparator controlled. And in that case, one of the treatment groups is not receiving placebo, but another drug, a comparator drug. So it may be um, an already existing drug for the same disease. This is also used because it may not always be ethical to provide one group with a placebo only. If the disease is very severe or um, quickly progressing, and especially if there is already um, an existing treatment available, it's not ethical to give patients a placebo. With that, I would like to hand over to um, Rick Thompson, who is the CEO of Find a Cure. Rick, here you go. Thank you very much, Krista. Um, really nice to be here, everybody. My name is Rick, and I run a charity based in the UK uh, called Find a Cure. Uh, Find a Cure works directly with rare disease patient groups and patients uh, with the aim of helping those groups to, to grow, 
to professionalize and to be really strong advocates and actors in the realm of rare diseases they work. And what this means for many of those groups is that they end up working in the, the world of drug development, finding ways to help to influence the development of new treatments for their rare conditions and to help their patients uh, take part in research. So what I want to talk about today follows on from what Chris has done so beautifully, which is to say, why do these things, why does drug development matter to patients, to rare disease patients, and why do we need to understand the clinical trial process and the drug development process to make things effective? So the, the, the first thing I'm going to focus on is the clinical trial, because that's the place where most patients may engage with this research and can have that direct hands-on experience. Chris has really nicely outlined the trial stages, the process, and what actually happens and the purpose behind those trials. But why, why do we need them? And why should you care as a patient? The ultimate aim, I suppose, for any clinical trial is to deliver a new, a safe, and effective treatment for a condition to its patients. And a clinical trial itself provides a really tightly regulated framework to give you the chance to prove that a treatment will meet that standard, will be safe and be effective for that group. In order for you as a patient to access a drug directly from your doctor, you need, you, you need to know that it's safe and effective and the doctor needs to know it's safe and effective. It needs to be licensed to treat that condition. And that's what the latter stages of the process that Krista was talking about, the, the regulation, the approval and reimbursement are all about. The approval gives a drug a license in the EU from the EMA, which says this drug can be prescribed for this condition. And that means a certain amount of evidence has been passed and shown that the drug is effective for that condition. Clinical trials give you that evidence. Clinical trials are the gateway to allow uniform access of a treatment um, to patients. That's why we should care about them. That's why we should try and do what we can to get them happening. Without that trial, you can't really generate that evidence to show what effect a drug has on a person. And that's what we're all about doing when we're looking at drug development. So a standard clinical trial is all about doing these two things, testing and proving a drug is safe and testing and proving that it is efficacious for the condition. So in the case of safety, it is obviously crucial to understand that a drug uh, doesn't do massive harm to people, to understand the potential side effects of the drug and any other potential um, harm that could be caused to certain subgroups of a population or certain types of patients. If you have that full perspective of the safety profile of a drug, as a clinician prescribing a drug, you have the chance to monitor the patient, to look out for these adverse events, these side effects, these problems coming up and, and mitigate them, provide certain types of, tra um, of treatments or management that make sure they're not gonna have a big effect on your patient. If a drug is has really serious side effects or causes serious problems, it might be deemed not safe enough to use in patients, or it might be deemed not safe enough to use in certain patients. I'm sure we're all familiar that certain drugs may not be allowed to be given to people during pregnancy, for example, and often there are serious safety issues around that. The efficacy uh, side of the clinical trial is all about demonstrating that this drug has a specific measurable beneficial effect on my specific patient population, my group of patients who have a certain condition. You don't want to give a drug to a patient if you're not con confident it will have a benefit. You don't want patients to be taking a drug um, that's going to potentially have the risk of side effects if you're not confident the benefit outweighs that risk. And finally, you don't want to be spending money valuable limited healthcare resource money on a drug that doesn't actually benefit your patients because that's a wasted opportunity someone else could be benefiting from that drug so clinical trials should give us all the information all the evidence we need to prove these two things and that should give us confidence in prescribing and delivering drugs to patients so if that's what we're looking for what makes the clinical trial successful what do you need for success well firstly and ideally you want a large number of patients who've been given the drug you're testing for a long period of time. This means you've got a large evidence base. You can see how lots of different types of people experience the drug and you can see how that experience might change as time progresses. It gives you the best chance to identify challenges in safety or the impact on the health condition you're trying to treat. Equally important though is having a large number of comparable patients who have not been given the drug. 
What this means is you have two cohorts, two groups of patients, and they should show a difference. And by comparing that difference, you can try and begin to infer that that difference is caused by the drug. You show what the drug does to the patient. To make this really effective, though, you need to ensure that both groups of patients have experienced pretty similar conditions during the trial. And this is what Krista was alluding to when she talked about the randomization element, is trying to make sure that there's no biases, no structural differences between those populations, which means they're more likely to be similar. Trying to ensure they're experiencing the same type of pattern of uh, environmental triggers, etc., that, that could make a difference uh, to them. If you have that control, that similar experience, that similar conditions for the two groups, what you can basically infer is any difference between the two of them in how they're experiencing their illness is fundamentally caused by the delivery of that drug. I.e. if the group that are given the drug are a lot better and healthier, it's probably because the drug has made them better. And that is the thing we're trying to test. So a randomized double blind placebo controlled trial is generally seen as the gold standard way of doing this. This gives you the best chance to provide strong evidence that the drug is making a positive difference to your patient. And that's what we're fundamentally looking for. Now, when you work in the world of rare diseases like I do, things become a little bit more complex. Rare diseases are fundamentally challenging, and that's because of the numbers. A rare disease is defined in the EU as a condition that affects fewer than one in 2,000 of the general population. Now, that equates to about three and a half million people in the UK, where I live, or about 35 million people across the EU as a whole. That's a large number of people, but if you divide that number by the estimated 7,000 different rare diseases, you suddenly see that some of those populations are quite small. Furthermore, those populations are dispersed. Individuals may be dotted around different countries. There might be quite a few in one country, small numbers in the other. It's hard to not just find the numbers of patients, but to see where they're located. They aren't often naturally clustered. And this makes it hard to find patients for clinical trials. That's a fundamental challenge of rare diseases. Compound this with the fact that there's really high unmet need in the world of rare diseases. It's estimated that, that there are only about 400 licensed treatments for rare conditions across those 7,000 different diseases. You can see many, 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 the vast majority of rare diseases go untreated. A huge chunk of them affect children, about 75%, and unfortunately, about 30% of those children will pass away before their fifth birthday. Uh, that's a, a huge need for treatment and a statistic that we really want to see pulled down quickly. There's a need for treatment in these areas with very severe uh, impacts on, on quality of life and also duration of life that needs addressing. And this means there's a big urgency for new treatments and work in the rare disease field. But there's also generally a lack of understanding and research in the area. Uh, it means that we don't necessarily always understand the natural history of a disease, which is essentially a posh way of saying of how the disease progresses from day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year. And it can also be hard to define an outcome measure. Um, this is something which tells you if a drug has been effective or ineffective, an outcome, a result, which tells you things have improved. And defining that can be quite challenging in a number of rare diseases because they are less well understood. And this again makes it hard to set up and plan your clinical trial. Now, these are all barriers that make things tough in rare diseases, but they also highlight the real need for work there. And what we do see in the rare disease world is that patient engagement becomes absolutely key in driving forward successful research and successful clinical trials. Rare diseases are really at the forefront of this in the medical research space because you need to have those patients who really understand their condition engaged to help tackle some of these tough problems and to have them engaged so they take part in the trials that can help find the treatments that are fundamentally needed for the population. So why should you take part in a trial as an individual? <clears throat> and firstly, we'll look at that very thing, actually engaging in a clinical trial, enrolling in a clinical trial as a patient. Now, clearly, trial participation is absolutely vital to deliver new treatments to patients living with a condition. By taking part in a trial, you give yourself the best chance to access a drug that's currently unlicensed, that is experimental, essentially, that, that could benefit you. And as we've seen in rare diseases, that might be the only type of treatment available. Um, what you're also doing by taking part in a trial, though, is giving the chance for other people with your condition 
to get it down the line, giving the chance for that drug to become licensed, to, be, to become available to a wider part of the population. It's a really positive thing that has great potential to drive research. However, if you are taking part in a trial, it is really important to manage your expectations. There, as, as Krista showed us, around 60% of phase two trials uh, will fail. So these are the first trials where you're really testing and digging in to see if a drug is effective in the condition it's been used for. Now, as an individual taking part in trial, you need to be aware of this. You need to be aware that this drug that you might be hoping can make a difference to your condition is quite likely not to have the impact you're seeking. And that can be very frustrating and challenging. Secondly, we've seen that control groups are absolutely crucial to clinical trials. They allow you to have a comparator. They allow you to show the size of the effect that a drug has. This is the thing that gives you the difference, um, the evidence to actually demonstrate the effect of the drug and therefore get it licensed. Unfortunately, though, that means when you take part in a trial, there's a very good chance you'll be put in a control group, given a placebo or some of the thing. And that is reducing your opportunity to access a drug that is unlicensed. Again, this is something you should be prepared for and understand. And you should also understand the actual working of the trial itself. In rare diseases, there are lots of different trial designs which may not use the more standard double blind placebo controlled randomized clinical trial. They may use a controls, um, a prospective trial, essentially where there is a control stage for all patients who then at a later point all move on to the drug. Or there might be situations in a number of trials where if a drug is proving to be very effective, people who have been placed in the control group can gain access to that drug at a later date before it is fully licensed. And these are all relatively um, common occurrences. However, the fundamental point stands controls are crucial and you need to be aware of why they're there and that you may be placed in that group. When thinking about clinical trials and taking part in them, it's, it's important to be aware that communication about trial progress and outcomes can be poor at times. And the reasons for this are often tied to the huge amounts of money that is that is going on to actually fund the clinical trial and the potential uh, reward of, of getting a new drug for the company that's developing it. And that's part of the process. It means it's hard to communicate about what's happening at times. And this can be very frustrating for patients. And what I'd recommend fundamentally here is when you're thinking about taking part in a trial, find out what that trial is committing to doing in terms of commu communicating with the patient and, and uh, telling you what's happening when, and really hold them to this. It's an agreement between yourself as an individual participating in the trial and actually allowing this research to happen. It can't happen without you uh, and the company themselves who are trying to run it and make sure it happens effectively. Make sure you hear what you should hear. Uh, hold them to that agreement and make sure everyone is on the right page. And alongside this, it's important when you're thinking about joining a trial to really read the clinical trial information and try and understand as well as possible what's happening. Seek clarity wherever and whenever you need it so you feel confident you know what is happening and what will happen to you as part of that trial. And really make sure it's the right trial for you, addressing a symptom that you feel you want to be addressed that can make an impact on your life and you feel can make an impact on the wider community because it's a huge investment of time and effort and commitment on your part to take part in that trial and it's crucial that those who commit to it really try and drive through to the end of the trial to give the best data possible for themselves and the wider community to access this drug widely later. Now beyond this personal engagement there is the uh, community engagement um, in clinical trials and drug development. And this is an area where patient associations can have a huge impact right across the board from the preclinical space right to approval. If we're working in preclinical, developing those early drugs without testing in humans, what we see is that many patient groups provide substantial funding into this area. They can help identify the key priorities for the patient uh, populations and help accumulate data about how a disease progresses. They can review research proposals and help to engage with the stakeholders that matter to drive the research in their condition forward. When we get into the stage of designing trials, patient groups often engage and patients as well in protocol reviews to try and understand what is actually going to happen. How will this trial be delivered and how will this affect the patients? They can help recruit people into clinical studies, uh, develop new endpoints, new measures of success for your drug testing and actually even change the way a site is set up to make it more effective, more friendly and more accessible for the patients themselves to receive, receive drug during a trial. 
In the trial, many patient groups support those patient participants. They help to ensure by doing this that they have retained on the study to give the best data possible from the trial. And also they can help provide really much more accessible, uh, personalized patient information. So patients really do understand what the trial is about and what's happening to them. Once the trial is complete, there's even a role for patient organizations and patients in analysis and dissemination, helping to share the results with the patients uh, more widely to understand the potential impacts, side effects and challenges with the drug and the benefits, and also interpret the real world meaning of these benefits. What does it mean that I can walk six meters further on this drug than I would otherwise? How does that affect my daily life? These are the insights that patients can drive. And finally, this type of information can feed through into approval and reimbursement, helping that drug with patient testimony to get actually approved for sale by regulators and approved for payment by reimbursement bodies. So the scope of impact patients can have in drug development is really very, very broad. I'd like to wrap up now with an example of one patient group and how they've worked in the area of rare diseases to drive themselves to a to the verge of having a, a widely accessible treatment for their condition. And this group is the AKU Society or the Alcapta Neuro Society who are based in the UK. Now Alcapta Neuria is also known as a black bone disease and it's, it's very rare, affecting about one in half a million people. So a very small patient population uh, suffer from this inherited genetic disorder. Um, it's a progressive disease, so it gets worse throughout life, and it's caused by an error in a single enzyme in the body. And this error means that a type of acid builds up in the tissues th throughout life. Now, the acid actually attacks cartilages and bone, and superficially it turns them black. So if you look carefully at patients, they have these black dots in the sclera, the whites of their eyes. Their ears often appear slightly bluish because of the, the black tint to the cartilage inside. Uh, their urine turns black. Uh, contact with air and the bones if you do uh, do a uh, surgery will appear black as you can see in this image but this blackness also leads to damage it leads to degradation of the bone it leads to an early onset form of osteoarthritis which is exceptionally painful and debilitating for patients in midlife and multiple choice replacements are very common now, at the point of formation of the AKU Society in the UK there was a failed trial for a drug called nitisinone in the US now that trial failed due to the poor endpoint selection. Uh, what this means is the trial was trying to measure how effectively uh, the drug changed something in the condition and what it was measuring was the range of motion at the hip of patients with alcaptanuria and the drug was trying they were trying to show that it would improve the range of motion at the hips. Now the drug works simply by stopping the buildup of the acid so a reasonable assumption would be you would halt the progress of the condition by giving the drug. The drug affects the entire body, the entire system, rather than just a single joint. And if you're halting progress, you'd expect things not to get worse rather than potentially to improve. And the endpoint selected was to improve the range of motion of a single joint in the body. Very limited and very ambitious and not really looking at the full pitch of the condition. And that fundamentally is why the original trial didn't succeed. So the AKU Society wanted to change this, have a go and see if this drug could still benefit patients. They engaged in a huge range of research from the preclinical space right through now uh, to the approval process. They conducted the first human autopsy in Alcaptanuria to better understand the condition and the breadth of the impact of the disease. They used the work they'd done to develop their own severity score, a measure that encompasses all the different impacts of the disease to use as an endpoint in the clinical trial, and also developed a mouse model to model the condition um, in the lab to test for new treatments. They built a collaboration, an international consortium, uh, to drive a clinical trial to test nitisinone again. Uh, and this included a company that owned the, the patent for a drug and also a clinical research organization to help deliver the clinical trial. Using this consortium and the research they'd done, they were able to secure funding from the European Union to fund a phase two and a phase three clinical trial to test the safety and efficacy of nitisinone in Alcaptanuria. They got advice from the regulators, the EMA, to understand exactly how this could be delivered, including learning that actually simply the level of acid in the blood could be enough uh, to lead to approval of a drug, not just needing uh, patient relevant outcomes like range of motion or, more importantly, the severity score the AKU Society developed. 
despite the fact the drug was already been given to patients in England, so removing a huge part of the population, the AKU Society were able to help recruit over 140 patients to their phase three study in a disease, which is one in a half a million, very rare. And the trial was completed recently with really positive data. And the group are now working with their collaborators and consortium to go to the EMA to secure approval and licensing for the drug. So this is a really nice illustration of the impact patient groups can have and a success story uh, for patient engagement and patient group engagement with drug development and research. So in summary, clinical trials provide a regulated framework to prove that new treatments are safe and effective for a wide and a wide distribution to a patient population. They are the thing that give us the evidence to say we can give this drug to lots of people. Rare diseases are clearly particularly challenging for clinical trials, but they are also a kind of hotbed for innovation. And we can see exciting new ways to design trials and deliver trials that are more effective for patients. And patients are fundamental to trial success, both in terms of actually participating in the trial, but also providing their insights to help us improve the way we're designing the trial process. Drug development pathway really is a long one. It can be many bumps along the way. Um, anyone engaging on a research program, either as uh, taking part as a participant or any group trying to engage in research, need to be prepared for these challenges uh, and prepared for the pitfalls that will happen. But know uh, that if patients and patient groups can engage, uh, it gives us the best chance to deliver effective treatments to patients far, far more quickly. Uh, so with that, I'll thank you for your time and I believe we'll be opening up shortly for questions. both Krista and Rick. So now we're moving to the question and answer section of our webinar. I'd also like to welcome on board Boyana Mirosavljevic, who is the Patient Engagement Officer at PSR and Ergomed. And Boyana will join Krista and Rick in answering some of the questions that you have all been asking during the webinar. Over to you, Boyana. Thank you, Lomena. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you all for being with us today. Uh, a lot of your questions, uh, we received a lot of your questions, uh, and I really try to group them somehow, to not repeat myself. And the uh, first question, I think, Krista, uh, I will forward to you. Uh, it is, uh, who approves the clinical trials? Thank you, Boyana. Uh, obviously, a very important question uh, because all clinical research before it is really started must get approval from actually two types of bodies or authorities one is the national authority so in the us that would be the fda and in europe that will be a national committee in each country and the second type of approval you need is from an ethics committee um, that really looks at the uh, methodology and uh, if the study is being conducted in an ethical manner. Uh, and they will also review all the documents that will be provided to patients, such as the consent form and any other information or questionnaires that are provided to the patients. So you always need to types of approval 
before you can actually start with a clinical trial. Thank you, Krista. Rick, I think this is good for you. Uh, if we are participating in a clinical trial in another country and we don't know the language, is uh, a translator provided? Yeah, another good question. Um, I'll, I'll probably get some input on Christmas as well, but the important thing is ties into what Chris just mentioned really, which is the, the ethics committees and the, the, the people who are involved in approving clinical trials. It's crucial um, from an ethical perspective that you fully understand what you're getting involved in, which is something I tried to mention in my talk, that you have the access to the information to understand the trial, the process and what it is you are taking part in. And because of that, there should be some degree of information that is provided in your language, whether that's patient information that's been translated or ideally a, a direct translation later will be there as part of your experience at the trial site itself. Um, so there, there should be a, a real strong effort made to make sure you're fully um, appraised of what's happening in your language directly. But in terms of the actual delivery on the trial site, I might pass over to Krista to say how you'd expect that to be delivered in your experience in running trials that you've been involved with. Yes, thanks, Rick. So um, um, Ergomed and PSR indeed have quite a lot of experience in um, uh, the um, execution of, of clinical trials in rare diseases. And in those type of studies, it does happen quite often that patients will uh, join a clinical trial in a different country. We call that cross-border enrollment. It's a difficult term. Um, and in that case, we indeed need to ensure that all written information is translated into the patient's own language so they can read it and understand it, but also that uh, the interaction with the study site staff, uh, with the doctor and the nurses um, will be uh, effective so that patients can um, ask questions and, and uh, the, the, the doctors can ask questions to the patients about any side effects or how they are doing. So in those cases, we indeed make an on-site interpreter available, preferably face-to-face. -face. Um, that's not always possible. And especially recently with the uh, COVID situation, we may need to revert to a telephone uh, interpreter, but we will ensure that uh, there is a good way of communication between the patient and the site staff. Thanks, Chris. That's really helpful. And just to add to that as well, I mean, we've been involved a little bit in a clinical trial uh, right now at Find a Cure. And, and, and a part that layers onto this isn't just about your own language, but making sure the language that is used in the documentation or the interaction of the trial is something that's accessible to the patient, that they can understand the complexity uh, of language around trials or, or, or science can be tough and accessible. And it's really important to try and make sure that language used in these documents is really clear and easy to understand for the patient, uh, even if it is in their language. So um, as I was talking about in my presentation, you know, do feel free to ask questions if ever you're engaging a trial and really make sure that um, you understand what's happening and have a full grasp of what's happening and that the effort has been made to communicate clearly to you in your language, uh, but but in, uh, in a way that you can fully grasp as well, which is really important. Thank you both. Uh, I must say that we get um, a lot of questions from patients. And Krista, I think, this is also for you. Is there a difference between gene therapy clinical trial and all other clinical trials? So in, in principle, the, 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 the methods used in the clinical trial, uh, as we explained during this uh, webinar, are uh, quite similar. But of course, the therapy is, is very different. So with gene therapy, usually it's a one-time therapy. Um, and um, what we still see, because gene therapy is still quite new and modern, um, the, the sites delivering the gene therapy need to have special requirements and, and training. So what you often see is that there might be a very limited number of treatment sites. So patients may need to travel to another country to actually receive the gene therapy um, and but after that for all the follow-up visits which are mo mostly to check 
safety and um, and efficacy. So the the um, uh, effect of the gene therapy on on the disease um, may be performed closer to home. So that's some something we we see quite often. Um, another big practical difference is that the um, uh, so-called follow-up period. So the period um, that you as a patient are being followed by the clinical trial after receiving the treatment or completing the treatment is very long with gene therapy. Um, currently, it stands at about 30 years. So after receiving, very often gene therapy is given to children and they will need to be followed up for 30 years because it is, as I said before, still quite a new type of therapy. So authorities want to make sure that on the long term, there are no negative effects um, on, on the body. So uh, that, that makes uh, a difference. And obviously it doesn't mean you need to go to the hospital every month for 30 years. In the, the first few months will be more intense. And after that, maybe it's just once per year that you need to go to the study site or maybe you can have um, telephone contact that will depend from study to study. So that, those are the, the, the biggest differences. Okay, next one. I think, Krista, this is also for you. Uh, a question is about drug repurposing. Uh, if a drug is registered for a non-rare disease for adults, can that specific drug be uh, repurposed and registered for a rare disease indication for children? The additional question is on safety for children. The drug is used of labor for years now and it's helpful, helpful in children. Okay, thank you. I know that Rick is very much involved, or Find a Cure, his organization is very much involved in repurposing. So I'd be inclined to pass this on to Rick if you are comfortable with taking this question, Rick. We'll have a go, we'll have a go. Yeah, why not? <laughs> so repurposing, for those that aren't, aren't aware, is um, it's the use of a drug in a different indication to that which it originally has a license for. So, for example, when you hear about people uh, trying to use aspirin to treat heart conditions, that's an example of using an old drug for a new thing. Um, so the question here is, is trying to dig in a bit more to the, the challenges around repurposing. Uh, so there's a specific drug and uh, asking if it can be repurposed and registered in rare disease indication for children. Um, when you're doing repurposing generally, there are different levels of doing it. Uh, so if you're trying to get the drug to be fully licensed uh, and approved for use, so to get a, a license and it can be sold to treat this condition, uh, then really you're going to have to go through a full clinical trial stage. Um, many of the benefits of repurposing lay in the fact that you know a lot about the safety and previous use of that drug. So if you're trying to take a drug that's used for adults uh, into the pediatric space, into the space of children, you would have to do probably some quite robust uh, clinical trials looking at the safety of that drug in, in children. And that'll be the route you'd have to go down. Of course, what you're asking about is a case where that drug has been used off-label already. So off-label use is using a drug that hasn't got the, the license to be used in that condition. And it's actually quite common in a lot of areas, particularly actually in, in pediatrics and the use uh, of child medicine. So if the drug's been used extensively off-label in children now and is helpful in children now, you will have a wealth of data upon that use. So what you'd be looking to do would be to collect as much information as you can across that use over the years to provide a portfolio of information to prove uh, the safety in those children and the efficacy in the condition. And that may give you a route whereby you could move to get the drug licensed and to be used on label using that, that history of inhuman use. But um, it's not a trivial task and there are many issues around trying to get a, a drug uh, that is used off-label or used in a repurposed kind of generic setting to be licensed for a rare condition. So I'd be very happy to chat extensively about that with you at some point if you'd like to talk about it, but it, it, it kind of highlights a lot of the challenges in developing these new treatments using repurposing, but things we need to improve definitely to, to get that benefit to the kids you've mentioned. Okay, thank you, Rick. Uh, I will encourage... Uh patient representative to contact you after this webinar and to check concerning this. Yeah, and, happy to chat. Okay, and do we have, I think we have a time just for one more. 
uh, what happens uh, when a clinical trial is completed? Is the therapy continued or stopped? Mm, I'd be happy to to answer that. So um, that's not not so, it's a very valid question, but not such an easy one because obviously once you've participated in a trial, especially if it's a phase three trial, so like the last step in the clinical development process, and it's been successful, then obviously you would like to continue using the drug and not stop and wait for it to first be approved, get the license, and then also get the reimbursement in place and, and be accessible through the normal channels, because that can take a long time, as we explained before. So uh, preferably, we always like to hear, and, and there's a trend now that a lot of companies, especially in rare diseases for which no um, good therapy, no adequate therapy is yet available, that they do make drugs available, especially to the patients who have already participated in the trial. So they have put their efforts and time and energy into participating in the trial and they have been contributed to the development of the drug. And um, to have a system in place, a program in place, which is called early access program, or expanded access program, depending on where you live, um, to indeed make it possible for patients who participated in a trial to continue using the drug until it is um, until it can be prescribed. But this is not always the case. It is not mandatory. Uh, in some countries, it is mandatory, but not everywhere. Um, so there may be cases, for instance, when the um, pharmaceutical company um, is still struggling with the production, they cannot produce enough of the drug, um, or there may be other reasons why a, a company would decide to not offer this continuing uh, of the drug until it is available through your doctor. So, but that is a very, very good question to ask when you are thinking about participating in a clinical trial. Um, it should be described in the patient information form. Um, but if it's not, always check with your study site and uh, see if, if there is a possibility after the trial to continue receiving the, the drug. Great, thanks, Krista. Um, I'll take over from here then. So thank you very much for the, the great answers, everyone. Sorry, the great questions, everyone. And thank you very much, Krista and Rick and Boyana for the great answers. Um, so this brings us to the end of today's webinar. Uh, we'd like to remind you of our next webinar in this series, which is titled The Screening Process, Enrollment in Clinical Trials and Informed Consent. This webinar runs on the 20th of October. Um, and you'll be seeing it obviously in social media and please feel free to reach out to us if you'd like any more details on that before it comes. Uh, so this ends our webinar for today and we thank you very much for attending. Um, as usual, uh, this will be available on the ErgoMed uh, website within the next few days, also the PSR website. Thanks very much everyone.